Reapportionment is the process of, I'll put that up there so you can try to figure it out as I'm talking. <laughs> as you know, reapportionment is the process of allocating or apportioning congressional districts among the 50 states. Redistricting is the process of redrawing district boundaries to adjust for population and other factors. Now, reapportionment is so basic to the American political system that it's found in the first article of our Constitution. The framers provided that a census be taken every 10 years, not to employ uh, statisticians and economists, but rather to make sure that the House of Representatives remained close to the people. That's also why the Constitution do, did not and does not set the size of the House of Representatives. Now, the Constitution does guarantee that every state will have at least one member in the House of Representatives, which is why Wyoming and Alaska, North and South Dakotas, and Vermont each have one House member, even though the population of those states is less than the California Senate seat. So think about that. Right? California state senator represents more people than there are in Wyoming, and Wyoming gets two United States senators and a member of Congress. So the first Congress had 65 members. The second had 105, and so on and so on. And throughout the 19th century, as every 10 years the population was counted through the census, the Congress simply said, okay, we need to have more seats. And this continued until the 1920s, when the House was capped by statute at 435. Actually, it was in 1910. Now, after that, reapportionment became a zero-sum game. If a state picked up one of those 435 seats, that meant another state lost it, right? Only 435 to be apportioned among 50 states. So in 2000, California picked up another congressional seat, our 53rd. That came at the expense of Wisconsin. Right, Wisconsin lost one, and that seat was moved from Wisconsin and the cheese heads to California, where the real cheese is made. <laughs> Realize that Wisconsin has officially protested that they don't like our cheese ads. You know. <laughs> I guess they don't have anything else to do now. Hey, now in December of each census year, so in December of 2010, the clerk of the House of Representatives will take numbers that are given to them by the Census Bureau and will announce how many seats each state gets. Now, since 1930, the apportionment has been based on that, the method of equal proportions. Okay. Now, I went into political science because I didn't do math very well, so I'm not even gonna try to explain that. But it was a method developed in the 1920s by the National Academy of Sciences. It has been litigated. It has been the US Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld it. And it's, easier to calc it's, it's much easier to describe than to calculate. But in essence, what happens is this. There, you have those 435 congressional seats. You take away 50. Right? That's the constitutionally guaranteed one seat per state. The next 385 seats are distributed to the states in, order, in an order determined by dividing the population of each state by the geometric mean of its current seat and the next seat. Okay? This process goes on until all 435 seats are distributed. So they don't say, okay, California gets 53 and we'll put 53 over here, and now Texas gets this. What they do is, here's the 300 and, here's the 51st, right? The first seat goes to the first 50 states. The 51st state goes, according to this calculation, to what state? And then the 52nd, the 53rd, 54th. In 2000, our last seat, was the 433rd seat distributed. Okay. So a shift of, a f because this is very precise, a shift of a few dozen people can have profound implications. In 2000, had New York had just about 20 or 30 more people counted than California, it would have gotten a seat and not California. It's been estimated that Oregon is going to pick up a seat after 2010 by seven people. Right. That's what this formula means. It also is estimated, the Election Data Service, which is a nonpartisan group in DC, has estimated 
that California could actually lose a seat by 18 people. Right, the difference between picking up, or not picking up, but the difference between keeping 53 seats and losing a congressional seat could come down to 18 people. So that's why the population projections are not good for California. There is no projection that I know of that, that projects that California will gain enough population to gain a 54 seat. At best, we remain static at 53, and the bad news is we may lose. And if we lose, it's going to be to North Carolina. Right? The way the numbers work out right now, if we remain static, North Carolina will only pick up one seat and, West, and Minnesota keeps a seat. Right? If we lose, that means, I'm sorry, I misstated that. There are two formulas if you, if you count this out. North Carolina will either pick up one or two seats. That second seat that North Carolina picks up either comes from California or in Minnesota. Right? That's where it comes down to. North Carolina will pick up either one or two. The second one will come from either California or Minnesota. Right? So we're in direct competition with Minnesota. And I must say that, that I apologize to California uh, because I contributed to Minnesota. My son and his wife moved there over the summer. So um, if we do not pick up a seat, this will be the first time in the state's history that we have not. Uh, we have decade to decade on average picked up 3.4 congressional seats. All right, so you can see the line going straight up. And if we don't pick it up, we will be the first time in the state, which no doubt will give rise to several articles in the New York Times and Nation and New Yorker about the Golden State going down the tubes again. So. Let me switch now and talk about the census and the importance of getting as good a count as we possibly can. Now, I assume that everybody here is relatively intelligent and rational, so I'm not going to waste any your time or my time talking about the crazies who are threatening to boycott the census as some sort of form of political blackmail, or the wackos who say boycott the census because it's a, it's a means of developing lists for concentration camps. We'll just forget those. On the other hand, as the pro tem point out, it's easy to say census and sort of fall asleep. Um, so let me remind you of three things why the census is important. First, Tar Heels. North Carolina, remember those guys. Second, money. As Dita's pointed out, billions of dollars in federal money are appropriated on population basis using the census data. This involves over 100 different federal programs, including Medicaid, highway planning, construction funds, TANF, Title I education grants, Head Start, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, because of the undercount, California loses billions of dollars in federal funds, and we already don't get our fair share. But let me again, again put this in context. Over the summer, San Joaquin County had to cut $10 million from its budget. Okay? Now, they would only have had to cut $9 million if the census, if the undercount had been less in California in 2000. They lose, San Joaquin County loses a million dollars a year in federal funds because of the undercount. Right? So they could have, and if you take that million dollars for the 10 years, they wouldn't have had a deficit. Right? So that's San Joaquin County, that's real. Um, and it's not only that, I mean, think of it this way. Um, there's a bunch of federal programs that are based not only on population, but also on a state's per capita income. Now, as I'll point out in a minute, and as, as you know, common sense tells you, people who are most likely to be missed in the census include poor people. The more poor people are missed, that distorts a state's average income. Right? The more rich people you count, how much money do you make? Well, I make $343,000 a year. The more poor people you miss, the average income for the state is distorted and goes up. Okay, Title I education grants, um, federal funds for foster care, vocational education, and Medicaid are determined all or in part by a state's per capita income figures. So we lose money not only by not counting people, but we lose money because certain types are not going to be counted, and that's going to distort our average income. 